weeks we needed. So instead of having students write essays, they wrote an open textbook. So in three months, we've developed a 700-page textbook on the topic that is openly and readily available, and we'll print and, uh, and sell that book at half, half the cost. Um, and the third example, Lee, do you want to come up at this point? Um, Lee's been working on the IP policy previously at Otago Polytechnic. And Lee, do you want to come up and, and, and talk from, from here? He'll talk about the third example and then our um, policy proposal for the university. Thanks, James. Uh, just to clarify, I didn't uh, particularly write the IP policy at Otago Polytechnic, but I lobbied on this principle and the people who wrote the IP policy uh, took on board uh, some of it. Um, this was a project funded by the Ministry of uh, Education in New Zealand. We wanted to somehow come up with a return on investment uh, to quantify what return there is for an academic uh, or a lecturer at the Polytechnic who understood intellectual property in terms of open practice but also used the popular social media uh, to practice their teaching and, in some cases, their research. We figured that it cost us $4,000 uh, one-on-one training um, with the staff member to understand how to use the internet uh, to a sophisticated level. And uh, through savings and gains, they returned $8,000 uh, in the first year. Uh, that's when we uh, looked at, say, marketing would spend this much on a billboard and a newspaper ad. The lecturer has produced an um, instructional video on how to make a lemon meringue pie was one example, and it's received 60,000 views on YouTube. So we just made a correlation between how much marketing spent to get cars not looking up at the billboard driving past compared to people actually clicking and watching the YouTube video, giving feedback, suggestions, and actually in other universities and polytechnics contacting that particular school and uh, talking about a collaboration and student exchange project. Okay, so the Open UC proposal uh, is in progress. It's made up of uh, four components, uh, one of which I'm going to talk about today, which is the IP proposal. Um, but it's, uh, we'll, we'll be working on making sure that if that proposal is taken on board in some way, that we have detailed the procedures for the business and service units to complement that. Um, that the uh, education and research policy uh, encourages that sort of practice and rewards and recognises that sort of practice and indeed so does the performance review process. That was the mistake we made at Otago Polytechnic. We only focused on the uh, intellectual property policy. You didn't get everything else in line. It just became a policy nobody ever read. Okay. Here are the four components of the proposed IP policy. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an IP lawyer and no one involved so far in this is an IP lawyer. Uh, we've simply used the network, the internet network, um, uh, to comment and, and uh, make recommendations. And the latest legalised to look at it uh, was the National uh, Union for the Academics, NTEU. Uh, their lawyer looked at it and gave it a glowing uh, response, so we're off to a good, good step from their perspective anyway. So I've spoken to Charlie, uh, Charlie Day at the Melbourne University after when I briefly mentioned the points of the IP policy proposal at my back table and it was uh, told to me that Melbourne University tried um, assigning IP to their staff and students and it failed and I wanted to know the detail to that uh, because that's what we're proposing. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, I think if, uh, the thing I've struggled to understand is that if a university or any other institution claims ownership over the products uh, or knowledge that's generated by their employees, then naturally if I was an employee, anything I came up with was in the shower, at home, when I was on holiday, I didn't do it in my work time, especially if I start to get into a bad relationship with my supervisor. And I don't think you need to look far to find those sorts of uh, examples or conversations. And also, I have more, more than, I, I currently work at the University of Canberra for uh, a little over one year now, so I bring with me a whole bunch of contacts and knowledge and products and uh, ideas, and so I'm not sure if I would have to surrender all of that. So I'm not sure that the institution claiming rights, uh, claiming uh, the rights of the IP generated uh, simplifies the process, unless, of course, your only people you're dealing with are only employees and have been working on their projects 100% of the time under your institution. 
So apart from the bad will that it might generate to make such a claim, um, I think to invert it and to say all staff own their uh, intellectual property is a good gesture, particularly for an institute like the University of Canberra, who's only just making steps towards uh, research. Um, but the second part of the proposal, I think, is the interesting trigger for those in the room who are not convinced by that argument. I think the problem, particularly on yesterday's morning scenario of that legacy of complexity that we had to deal with on a general scenario, I think it was 11 years in total, was created because at the outset a trigger wasn't initiated with an intellectual property support office at their institution. That that was only, only occurred at the end of the process or when somebody realised they might have had a commercial entity in hand and then they went and contacted their IT intellectual property office and then unfurled all of that complexity they had to untangle. So what we're saying is that if you use the University of Canberra as a platform to publish your intellectual property, a lectern recording system, a learning management system, which is an online website thing, um, it, we'd have to find out the detail of this. The default is to Creative Commons Attribution. That awards the university uh, able to take a copy, anyone else is able to take a copy. It uh, affords us a lot of opportunity gains, such as the one I mentioned with the Targa Polytechnic, getting contact by other institutions to talk about collaborative and student exchange projects. Um, but if there's a problem with that, then you opt out. And that opt out is the trigger to the intellectual property office. And I think that would potentially solve or at least give the intellectual property office more accurate triggers to then go into an intervention with their, um, their uh, academics. How the detail of that, I mean, one example is that the screen interface is when I'm uploading a video to YouTube, for example. This is one suggestion we've made to our IT department. When I'm uploading a video to YouTube that expresses uh, a project or an idea that we're working on, uh, what I really want is that video to also copy across to my library archive, to the National Archive, the National Library if they'll have it, and to a couple of other video sharing sites. And there isn't a tool that enables me to spread that video across all of those, but of course if the university came up with such a tool and then added a little drop down that says what copyright are you going to apply and that automates a trigger to the intellectual property office, and I think at least in terms of the online realm, you've given a service that's very valuable to somebody who wants to distribute their information out and uh, put in a little trigger uh, that will initiate the intellectual property office. So if you want to opt out of the Creative Commons attribution default from the Institute, uh, then you have to make contact and, and discuss, and that discussion might be educative or, uh, or, or commercialization process. And the other one that I learnt from New Zealand, uh, to my knowledge there isn't an Australian intellectual property policy that recognises indigenous autonomy on the, on the notion. In New Zealand this is common. Uh, and I think uh, as complex as that would be for us, it would be nice to be part of an institution that made the first steps in this direction, um, perhaps using the New Zealand um, experience as a guide. So that's the, the intellectual property policy, one part, I'll just go back, one part of four parts. In response to James Neal, a researcher and t uh, teacher, how do we come up with a policy that recognises his practice and encourages it to become the norm so that the majority of the intellectual property or activities going on in the university is exposed and the minority that it might have commercial value is still potentially protected. So the discussion points, it's just repeating what James said. They have vast amounts of unrealised intellectual property, uh, intellectual capital. Uh, could this be a way to capitalise on that so, uh, as yet uncapitalised? And uh, does a protect protectionist stance justify these um, lost opportunities by defaulting to all rights are reserved and to require username and password to see educational materials? What is the value of that lost opportunity? The, the person who wasn't motivated to get the login or didn't have the $20,000 fee to, to access the course, and et cetera. And the proposed IP policy, we hope, gives a more reliable trigger to an intellectual property office who wanted to offer service. I think that must be over time, is it?
I've just got a question about open access and ownership of copyright. Um, a little while ago, a couple of weeks ago, one of the directors of one of our institutes, I'm um, at La Trobe University, contacted me. They'd been publishing papers on their website that had been presented by people all around the place at various colloquia and seminars organised by this institute. And this attracted the attention of the National Library of Australia that really wanted to put these papers uh, in a repository. And the library said, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put this in our repository if you give us a royalty-free, non-exclusive, perpetual license to the papers. Uh, and the director said, can we do this? Well, what do you think we had to say? Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, no yeah. we can't because we don't own the copyright. Yes, yes. <laughs> you have to go and ask every one of these people, every one of these authors, yep. to either give you a license or the university a license or mm. assign copyright before we can uh, help the National mm. Library mm. put this on open access in its repository. Mm. That was a National Library requirement? Yes. Yeah, it would be interesting for us to look into because I, I would imagine that they're um, moving in a similar direction to the federal government kind of licensing. Um, I guess that's, it's those kind of points of friction which cascade right down and eventually becomes kind of gridlock in, uh, in universities and uh, doesn't encourage the, the entrepreneurial and um, intellectual kind of spirit that, um, that ideally should be up and down the corridors and, uh, and around the campus. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't know about that. A question regarding the, yeah, the metrics for, for your research outputs. Because if you go open source, um, is there any thing which is where you're thinking of how to get this into the ERA system, for example? Because for my knowledge, this is quite outside of the normal metrics how universities get rewarded by the government for mm. research outputs. Mm. So it's a really important thing how to consider that. It, I guess it's... I'm guessing it's only a matter of time before we see more sophisticated metrics come in, uh, whether it's website hits or that sort of thing. I mean, at the moment, they're relatively primitive. It's um, number of publications, and if you're lucky, citation rates. But I don't know that even citation rates are um, really registering yet in performance reviews and, and so on. But yeah, we would hope that um, we could get far more sophisticated metrics, not only about how much access, but about what kind of access um, people are making to, uh, to the material.